All right, so hello everyone. Again, I'm gonna just repeat what I said before. Welcome to a discussion, a panel discussion about Vermont's gun policy. And I'm joined tonight with a few guests, which is great, um, but I first wanna introduce myself. I am State Representative Emma Mulvaney-Stanick. I use she, her pronouns. And I live in Burlington, Vermont's Old North End. I represent Chittenden 17, which just got renumbered. It used to be Chittenden 62 for anyone who pays attention to those numbers, but it's half of the Old North End and half of the New North End um, in Burlington. I've served for one term and I serve on the House Commerce and Economic Development Committee. However, gun policy is certainly one that interfaces all aspects of policy. And that's why I'm excited to host this event, um, not only for folks in my district, but um, for folks who want to tune in and or watch this later on. So with that, I want to turn over um, and introduce our three panelists tonight, just to ask each person to, to spend a minute or so introducing yourself and your organization. And then what we have planned tonight is a conversation um, to kind of go over, over what's happening in the state, what's happening federally, um, and then uh, to also talk a little bit about what's possible going forward, including what your organizations are, are working on, including a couple of questions. But as people have questions going, as we get going, feel free to put them in the chat and we will we'll bring those up. Okay, so with that, who would like to kick it off among our panel to introduce yourself? Grace, do you wanna go first? You're sort of to my left. Yeah, I definitely can. My name is Grace. I use she, her pronouns. I am a UVM grad. I graduated class of 2021, so just recently, but I am originally from Newtown, Connecticut, and my interest in gun violence prevention started about 10 years ago following Sandy Hook. Um, I offer a personal perspective, but also I studied political science in college, so I want to do this with my career and we're writing legislation for gun sense right now um, for this upcoming session that I hope will do a lot for Vermont's gun laws. Thanks, Grace. We're really happy to have you here and, and have gun sense Vermont in the conversation. Um, let's go to the other, our other Vermonter and then we'll introduce our, our national panelist guests. Uh, Louisa, do you want to introduce yourself? Oh, sorry. Wait, we're, uh, we lost Allie. Sorry. Allie will be back. We have someone from Moms Man Action. Louisa, you're from Vote Mama, who's the next one. So I'll let Allie back in and, and we'll go to um, we'll go to Luba first um, from Vote Mama. Hey everyone. I'm Luba Gretchen Shirley. I use she, her pronouns. I am a mom of three. I have a two-year-old, six-year-old, and eight-year-old. I'm the founder and CEO of Vote Mama. We are the first organization in the country dedicated to electing progressive moms up and down the ballot. And on our foundation side, we are working to break down the cultural and structural barriers that moms face and working with legislators to pass family-friendly legislation. I was the Democratic nominee for Congress in New York Second District back in 2018. And running with small children is a completely different experience and we need more moms in office. We don't have enough. We don't have people who understand how the policies that they're working on actually affect our lives every day. And that is what we're working to change. We're working to make it easier for moms to run and we're making it easier for them to serve in office. Thanks, Luba. I appreciate you all being here. And now, Ali, we were just doing just brief introductions. You were there and you weren't there. So welcome back. And Ali, do you want to just explain, uh, just introduce yourself and just a, a sentence or two about your organization. Oh, and hold on, let me um, co-host you one second. Great. Sorry about that. Our internet was unstable, so I tried to restart it. It seems to work, but if I cut out, please let me know. Um, my name is Allie Breyer. I usually hear pronouns. I'm the communications team lead volunteer for um, Moms Demand Action for our, the Vermont chapter. And we're committed to building a diverse movement of power to enact change at all levels with the single mission of preventing gun violence. I got involved in this work um, uh, back in January, um, and really it was Part of the reason was I wanted to make sure what happened to me doesn't happen to other people. We had to leave our homes because of a violent armed neighbor um, who, um, who threatened to murder us um, with guns and there was just no intervention. So it was really problematic and it really highlighted how lax our gun laws are and how we are not protecting people. Um, so I just wanna say thanks for having us here today and, um, and having this important discussion. Thanks, Allie. And I think it just shows how the both um, well, all three of you actually for that matter, but the personal story and connection to this policy is one of the major reasons why it's so critical um, to, to have this conversation. Um, and before we go on, uh, Kelly, just because I'm in the middle of speaking, can you message that person just to give us their name before we let them in? 
Okay. And so just moving forward, so maybe just toggling between um, Allie and Grace as the Vermonters on the call, can you kick us off with just a little bit of understanding? I know this was helpful for me when I sort of dove into it a few weeks ago, just to understand where is Vermont right now in terms of our gun policy and what are some basics that you think folks, because remember this is being recorded, so what, have, what are some pieces of information that folks should probably know about the status of our current gun laws? Uh, we'll get to where we need to be, but like just where are we right now in terms of um, Vermont? Um, we're not far enough, for sure. Vermont has one of the most lax gun laws in the country, and we have Governor Scott has vetoed a lot of gun legislation that Gun Sense personally has brought to the table, as well as um, other legislators. And it becomes frustrating because a lot of the people, a lot of legislators, support this issue and want gun sense or gun sense laws and it is just not being seen on the level of the governor and we're trying to push for just basic common sense laws that include safe storage waiting period um there is a loophole within the charleston loophole within our background check law that um we're trying to erase as well as uh, get rid of ghost guns, which have become an up and coming problem. Um, specifically, there's problems in Connecticut with it. And I think that Vermont should kind of get ahead of that as well. Um, there hasn't been a specific case of ghost guns in the state that I personally know of, but that doesn't mean that it can't happen. So that's something that our organization can just put on our legislative agenda. And Grace, I know for me as a new legislator last term, um, could you define the Charleston loophole and just give a little more context on that? And, you know, again, I I think I had some wild assumptions that we were further, at least in my perspective, along than we are. So do you mind just defining that for folks? Sorry, my connection is being odd right now. Um, it's basically that uh, it allows gun dealers to sell to people without background checks. Um, I'm sorry that I don't have more clearer instructions. I'm not sure specifically like why that is, but it ends up, a lot of people end up slipping through these cracks uh, that Vermont needs to fill because this is allowing for more suicide rates and more gun violence in our towns. Um, yeah, I, I wish I had more specifics, but I'm sure I could just look it up and get back to you. <laughs> Thanks, Grace. And I just, I think when we um, can define terms, that's just helpful. I mean, for folks to, who are not in the everyday of understanding gun violence. And I know that, and, and perhaps Ali will go here, but we did do a little tiny bit on this in the last uh, legislative session here in Vermont uh, to expand uh, the number of days, uh, essentially trying to close that loophole a little bit more. I think we wanted to do something much bigger, 30 days versus what we landed on with seven days. Um, it used to be three days in terms of when uh, people would be able to be given a gun if their background check didn't come back. But Ali, maybe you can just build off of what Grace offered up and anything that you thought you think folks would benefit from knowing about, again, the current state of Vermont laws in, in terms of guns. Yeah, I'd say we've made some very, um, you know, small steps towards, you know, the policies that we want to see. And we really do have some amazing gun sense champions, gun, gun sense policy um, champions in the legislature. And so I really want to commend a lot of the work that they did this last legislative session because they really did do a lot of the championing. And then we see um, Governor Scott, you know, veto some of these really just common sense gun violence prevention measures. You know, we shouldn't have any loopholes like the Charleston loophole. Um, and if, you know, uh, explaining a little bit more, basically in three days, if they do not, if the background check doesn't come back, because we have a federal background check system in Vermont, so it goes through the federal database, um, which lots of issues there, but I won't get into it um, now at least. Um, and so it allows three days, um, anything after three days, they just get the gun. Um, and oftentimes, after those three days is actually because they're doing more research or things like and there's these people are often denied. Um, we wanted to extend it permanently. Governor Scott said, I think he changed to seven days in the in the compromise. Um, 
So I think it just goes to show that we really need to um, make sure we're electing more gun sense candidates to override some of these vetoes if that, ha if that happens again. Um, a big thing we've also been focusing on is the extreme risk protection orders or they're called ERPOs. Um, and in these, um, a law enforcement official can petition a judge, petition a court, the court directly to have guns removed in cases of um, where the person might be um, going to harm themselves or others. Um, again, we would like to see that strengthened because you know there's so many issues with law enforcement. Um, you know, people might not feel safe contacting them; could be dangerous, causing trauma. You know, especially with our um, systemically marginalized communities or communities that have been over policed. It really doesn't feel like a um, great option to call police in those situations to have guns removed. So, you know, we're really hoping to strengthen that and see family members, neighbors, really, you know, healthcare providers be able to have that initiative too. Um, there's, yeah, there's definitely a lot more work to be done. Suicide is a huge issue in Vermont. We are, we're eighth in, uh, 18th, sorry, in the country. And it is like the eighth um, highest rate of, um, I'm not gonna use statistics. I'll just won't remember them, but it's a high number here in Vermont. And in 2021, we actually had the highest number and rate of suicide deaths that we've ever had. Um, and so when we're talking about um, gun violence prevention, we also need to be talking about funding a lot of suicide prevention initiatives. And we did get some um, big wins on that in the budget this past year um, with a lot of funding going towards suicide prevention. Um, and then I just would be remiss to say that um, when we talk about suicide prevention, it's not just about mental health. A lot of times people, there's a myth that people who die by suicide die by suicide because of a mental health issue. And oftentimes it could be because of um, relationship issues, trauma, sexual violence, really um, housing, eviction, you know, other sorts of violence that we see in our society. So when we're talking about that, we need to be thinking about it through the whole span of things, providing housing, providing culturally um, sensitive health care and mental health care, um, and really thinking about this in a holistic view, because gun violence prevention is not just um, talking about the guns themselves, but everything that creates the um, the atmosphere or the culture around it. Um, yeah. Thanks, Allie, and thanks, Grace. I think uh, it's it's so helpful to get a handle on you know where we are as a state, and and and, I've, and we're going to hear from a, um, a second year from um, Luba around the national context and how we either compare or or the, also on the federal level of what we might be facing, but I, I I was very surprised about sort of the possession, right? The ability to get your hands on a gun and how overly easy it seems, at least from my, from my um, vantage point. And while we have some light touches around an age requirement of 21, um, the, the passing of, of guns through families, like, you know, just it's, there's no license required, there's no permit required, there's no training required. And same thing for gun dealers, it just seems like a, um, a, a ticking time bomb on many levels. And so I really look forward to it. We're gonna have some conversations to get deeper into this in a, in a moment, but just in terms of setting the context, um, Luba, I'm wondering if you could now give us a little sense of, um, from a national level, since you're um, joined, tuning in from the national level, um, to give us a little sense of like what, how your organization has interfaced on this and just thoughts on where, where things are and where they might be headed on a federal level. <sighs> I want to say I'm super excited about the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act. It's the first big piece of legislation that we've gotten passed in three decades, and we have Moms Demand to thank for that. I'm somewhat excited about it, but it didn't go far enough. But what it does do, I mean, it funds crisis intervention, including red flag laws. It closes the boyfriend loophole. It now has enhanced background checks for people between the ages of 18 and 21. In my opinion, there should not be there should be a ban until you're 21 that you cannot purchase a gun. You can't purchase alcohol in this country until you're 21, but you can purchase a gun. That I would like to see that go further. I would like to see there be an assault weapons ban. But this, I mean, this is the first federal law making gun trafficking a federal crime. So there is so much good that has come out of this bill, but there is so much more that we need to do. And I, you know. I am not an expert on gun violence. I am an expert on electing moms. And every mom that we support is somebody who will fight for common sense gun regulation. I have three children and my kids do not know really what happens yet. The first day that my daughter started kindergarten, Shannon Watts actually came to speak at an event for one of our candidates and we were speaking. And I told her, I told her I'm terrified to send my kid to school. 
school. I don't want her to go through lockdown drills. And we were talking about some of the research that every town has put out that talks about what it does to children to go through lockdown drills, how it's harming our kids, how it's setting them up for a life of remembering this and having that trauma be instilled in them. You know, I graduated high school the year before Columbine happened. I never experienced this in school. I have no idea how anybody can go to school and worry about this. The day after Uvalde, I dropped my kids off and I remember literally thinking, my daughter's second grade classroom is pretty far away, but my son's kindergarten classroom is the first classroom. And how much time will they have to hide? And that's what every mom is thinking about when they drop their kids off at school. And that needs to change. And I literally, I kid you not, like 20 minutes before we got on the Zoom, an old colleague of mine from Ghana sent me a video of Marjorie Taylor Greene talking to a British reporter saying, well, you don't understand. You're from across the pond. We're Americans. We love our guns. And she said, please explain this to me. And I cannot. I cannot explain this obsession with guns that we have in this country. And until we elect more moms who are actually going to change this, until we elect more people who understand that fear, it's not going to change. Moms Demand has been doing an absolutely amazing job holding all of these legislators accountable. We have people in office who have been bought by the NRA, who are owned by the NRA, and who will vote because the NRA tells them to. And yet our children are going to school, and I don't know if you guys saw recently, but there was some contraption, I cannot remember what it was called, but it was basically a vault that you could hide in in case there's an active shooter. The fact that that exists in this country is mind boggling to me. The, the, the fact that our children are thinking about that even, that they have to ask questions about this, that we're putting our kids through this because we can't pass any common sense gun regulation, it's, it needs to change. And we have to change who has a seat at the table. Moms Demand worked so hard to pass this bipartisan bill. And there are a lot of Republicans who still voted against it. And there are a lot of people who don't agree with it. And it's a start. It's a start, but my fear is that people, especially at the national level, will think, oh, we did something. We don't have to keep fighting for this now. It was a start, and we need to make sure that we're continuing to fight to pass even stronger reform. We're the only country in the world that this happens in. Other countries do not have mass shootings at this level. We have more guns than people in this country. Thank you, Luba. I think it's such an important context, right? And it really emphasizes why state government matters in this conversation. Um, and if the federal government can't lead on moving us towards common sense, community safety, responsive, uh, and bold, frankly, gun, gun policy that moves us away from this um, endless and senseless violence that we're continuing to live through, um, then the states need to step forward. And that goes to the state legislatures and it goes to the governor. And I appreciate um, my Vermonter panel panelists here really naming the reality that we're facing here where one person, despite of overwhelming support of the Vermont legislature trying to really move meaningful gun policy forward, can single-handedly, you know, um, tank a bill um, that we've tried to advance. And then the threshold is pretty darn high to override that veto, but still it, it all connects, right? It all connects there. So I'm wondering what's going to kind of the piece that I think I'm, Ali, I'm gonna have you um, start us off if it's okay, because you mentioned you touched on mental health and suicide. Vermont struggles with this. We struggle with, and I'm looking, I have a colleague on uh, Representative Tanya Vahoski, um, who uh, is a social worker and therapist, so she knows this well. Um, but, but really trying to understand how gun laws intersect. I talk a lot about intersectionality as a policymaker and how nothing's in isolation. We're structured to think about in isolation because our committees are like, you work on guns and judiciary over here, you work on economics here, you work on human services, but it is so intersectional to really understand the impact of, of gun policy, in this case, on the world of mental health and the world of um, suicide. So I'm wondering, Ali, if you could um, speak to how uh, Vermont's gun laws intersect and, and you could even go like, wh what else should we be thinking about and, and doing in the terms of, of um, doing all that we can to support Vermonters who, who live with mental illness um, and making sure that we're, we're being supportive and understanding how guns are a piece of that. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And it really is, everything touches each other. You, it's, you can't look at any of these issues alone because none of them, you know, all of them are part of this bigger system that we see. Um, and so, yeah, we see in Vermont, um, a lot of suicides and many of them are um, suicide by gun, um, about 87% of them. Um, and this is largely because of one, we, um, the lethality of guns. So people who choose to use a gun for suicide will likely die because of 
the just high lethality of it and uh, easy access to them. So, we, you know, we saw a, a waiting period bill vetoed a couple, couple of years ago. Um, and this has been proven through um, lots of research and data that these actually help prevent um, suicides. Because a lot of times we see um, with suicide that, <clears throat> excuse me, that it, it can be just, um, uh, I don't want to use, I, you know, it can happen sort of in, in the heat of um, your emo emotions when it's something that'll pass. Uh, and so when you have something so lethal in these sort of kind of uh, split second decisions, it's, it leads to a lot of, um, you know, death and trauma in our communities. Um, and so this is why we um, need to be thinking about this ERPO bill um, and getting um, extreme risk protection order bills um, expanded so that family members and friends are able to petition the courts to have guns uh, removed in these situations. We need to be talking more about safe storage. That's really important too, so that we're having even a buddy system. So if you have a gun, 43% of Vermont households have guns. So that's also another reason why we see such a high um, amount of suicides in Vermont. Um, and so, you know, having a buddy to, to have hold on to your gun if you're feeling, um, you know, if you're in crisis or, you know, experiencing suicidal thoughts, it's really important um, to do that. But then even broader than that, how do we destigmatize these conversations around suicide? Because it is still such a stigmatized topic in our communities. How can we have these conversations without being fearful that people will, um, you know, not know how to respond or, um, you know, really just it, it, dismiss it. Um, and, and a lot of folks, you know, they don't really know how to have the conversations with people who they might be worried about. Um, and so we kind of just tuck it under the rug. Um, and this is really the situation where we just need to be talking about it more often to really think about how we can break some of these myths around suicide and the stigma, stigma with seeking treatment. You know, a lot of, um, it's mostly men who die by suicide um, and die by suicide with gun. And there's a lot of cultural issues wrapped up in that about being man, um, the idea of being manly and um, not being able to talk about your feelings or having feelings of suicide. So how do we change, how do we change this culture around, um, you know, men and mental health? Um, that's just a huge, <laughs> A huge thing. Um, and then, yeah, as I had mentioned earlier, we really need to be thinking about this holistically. So are we creating policies that provide safe and affordable housing? Are we creating policies that make sure people have all of their basic needs and more, um, that they have, you know, stable work, um, they have all of these other sorts of things um, so that they don't feel like suicide is the only option. So it's a big thing. Um, and it's, it's so interconnected, as you mentioned. Thanks, Ali. And I, I really appreciate you lifting up that those final points around making sure people meet their basic needs and the and the importance of understanding economic security is a huge portion of it. I mean, it's not it is is not um, just when people are in a mental crisis, it's when they're in a, like an economic and structural crisis in their lives, right? And the easy access to guns does not help the matter. And if we, again, if we, if we think about things in isolation, um, we don't understand why our communities have gotten to this point. We have to really understand that, you know, insecure housing, as you're saying, jobs that don't pay livable wages, the stress of working two to three jobs. I mean, that all builds up. And I'll just tell you as a working mom with two jobs, being a legislator and um, a consultant on the side, it is bananas at times. And it is, it, it, I mean, at any moment, anyone who's, who holds multiple stressors at a time can really can just relate in your darkest moments. It's it's a hard space to hold. Um, and how, to, how do you release that pressure, that stress, that anxiety? So um, Grace, to you, just uh, from the uh, Vermont perspective first, before I see if, if, if Luba wants to add anything on the mental health piece, is there anything else you want to add on to round out this conversation on the state level and mental health and guns? Yeah, I would say that Vermont is really lacking resources in the mental health department. And I work also with a mental health nonprofit in the state, and there's just a high turnover rate, lack of funds, X, Y, Z. These are always something that we can fix and that will really help us in the end with mental health. But as everyone has been saying, intersectionality between gun laws and mental health is so important. Just as someone can seek out a gun to harm someone else, they can also seek out a gun to harm themselves. 
And that is directly correlated to someone in a mental health crisis. Um, and therefore, if we focus on mental health as well as focus on these basic, we're emphasizing safe storage being very important in this case. When I think of a violent occurrence happening as well as someone um, committing suicide, there's a lot of steps prior to the event that we could have done something and something could have stopped them like a lock on a safe. It could be that very simple, the just not having that access as well as being having a 48 hour waiting period to really sit and think about, is this the right decision? Not getting the gun right away, that's very important. And these just basic common sense gun laws will just help us so much in the end. Thanks, Grace. The easy access piece. Luba, do you wanna add anything on a federal level, either in the bill you were mentioning before, if there's something you wanna lift up or just in general about this, this um, piece? It is listening to everybody right now, just thinking about this. It is literally easier. You in a, in a shorter period of time, you can purchase a gun than you can get an appointment with a therapist. It is so difficult to get an appointment with a therapist in this country. The first thing you have to do is call your insurance company or go online and figure out how to use the website. And then you have to call multiple different therapists and see if they're taking any new patients or if they take your insurance. And if you're in a mental health crisis, you don't have the ability to do that. Frankly, if you're not in a mental health crisis, you don't have the time to do that. And I know many people who have just given up on finding a therapist because they don't have the time to do that. And then even if you are able to find a therapist who is taking a new patient, you can't afford the co-pays. Our insurance is terrible. We all knew this. We cannot pass universal health care in this country, yet we can't pass universal background checks in this country. And it's this, this ridiculous system where you can't get in to see a therapist. Your health insurance doesn't cover mental health care. It's looked down on. There is such a stigma in this country in terms of actually protecting your mental health. And if you talk about it at work, your employer will immediately judge you. That is another stigma that we need to talk about. But you can go out and buy a gun. And it's just the reality of what's happening in this country and it needs to be addressed. And yet we have so many representatives at the federal level and frankly across the country at the state level as well that don't care. All they care about is their NRA dollars. And until, until we really, I mean, Moms Demand is doing such an incredible job organizing people, we need to get more people into office who get that issue and who will fight for it. I, I am thrilled to see, I mean, the, the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act has, has funding for mental health. It's great. It's important, especially for the children who are traumatized. How many children are traumatized by surviving a school shooting? How many are traumatized by knowing somebody who didn't survive? How many are traumatized just by the lockdown drills, by the active shooter drills? My mom is now 68. She retired two years ago, but she came home one day from school in tears because she was in the middle of a lockdown drill. And this is a woman in her mid sixties and she had to, if the kids were in the hallway, she had to lock the door and she wasn't allowed to let them in. And she was watching the kids through the, the window and the door having a panic attack in the hallway. And she came home and she said, all I could think about it if, if it were my children. And she just started to cry. If we're doing that to teachers, to people who have been teaching for decades, just the thought of having to go through a lockdown drill and watching what's happening to the kids that you teach, if we're doing that to teachers, what do you think it's doing to kids? So uh, this is, we're adding to the mental health crisis by just forcing them to go through the lockdown drills. We can't get therapy. We can't pass gun laws. It's a mess. I am sorry. I do not have anything more positive or uplifting to say. I am, I am happy we passed some legislation. But it's our country does not have its priorities straight. I I welcome the real talk because that's why we want to, that's why this this and so many more conversations need to continue to happen on repeat and loudly to really start to move things. As I met, as we talked about earlier, if not on the federal level, on the states, then the states individually need to start to lead on this. And um, and I also am a mom of two small kids, and the amount of trauma which we we have now for. I mean, Columbine was 1998 or 99. I can't remember exactly the year, but a whole, almost two generations almost have now been raised as that is the context of this overarmed, militarized experience in schools, in public schools. And, um, and not to mention what it's doing to the staff. It's almost a whole generation of staff as well who know nothing other than teaching or trying to be a school counselor or trying to be a principal or support staff. 
um, it's it's really uh, it's it, it, if you just sit and really actually think about it for a minute, it's um, it, it, I can't believe how people can't feel some level of emotion, and I think that's part of like, just going back to mental health. The desensitizing that continually starts to happen just to survive is probably like a coping mechanism. I'm going to look at my therapist colleague Tanya there, but like it's probably like a natural coping mechanism. But that is it is an unnatural response when we know we are the cause of it because we allow these um, these policies to continue to go unchecked. So there's a question in the chat and I, I want it, to, it's this one sort of like um, tied to it. So I'm gonna ask my question first and then the question from, from Kelly. Um, and again, reminder for folks who are on the call tonight, you can certainly put a question into the chat and I'll fold it in as we, as we go. Um, but the next question I was gonna ask sort of leads into this one um, around how do we start to create safe communities specifically in our schools that we were just talking about and public spaces, of course, um, knowing that we're not immune in Vermont to violent culture um, or the reasons that lead to mass shootings. We've, we all know, those of us who pay attention, that the, even the stuff that finally gets the media, we've had a lot of close, close calls, and one that I'm gonna uh, raise in a second from Kelly's question here in Vermont. Um, and there's many things we probably never even knew about, right, that are just here in Vermont, and we should obviously be concerned about what's happening outside of our borders as well as the state. But just um, to our folks, um, how do we create these safer communities, specifically in schools and public um, spaces, knowing that the violent culture is, is alive and well, um, both in our state of Vermont and, and uh, nationally. Lou, I'm gonna throw that one to you first, um, just on the national, yeah, easy question, right? Um, but maybe just to build, and again, not looking for magical solutions, but what are, what are major steps forward when we think about protecting communities, protecting our, our public spaces, schools in particular? As you were asking that, I literally said in my head, I have absolutely no idea. Yeah. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, what, what do we do to, we have to pass legislation. We have to make it easier to not have guns. I, there isn't an answer other than that. In terms of protecting my own kids, I don't have them go through lockdown drills. I have asked the principal to let me know on the days that they will have them and I keep them home because I don't think that it's, that they're mentally, I don't want to put them through that mental anguish and that anxiety. And Having, having school resource officers, arming people at the door, having more guns doesn't make our schools safer. It makes them more dangerous. You look at what happened with Uvalde, I'm sorry, but I'm gonna say the bullshit that they always say about a good guy with a gun. How many good guys with guns were standing there getting hand sanitizer and not going in? They were locking up children's parents. If I had been there, if any of us had been there, we would have run in to try to save our children. They were handcuffing parents. So those are the good guys with the guns. They weren't keeping anybody safe. They were standing there and waiting. So I don't, beyond actually passing legislation, beyond passing an assault weapons ban, beyond increasing the age, the vast majority of people who commit school shootings are white men between the ages of 18 and 21. We couldn't even raise the age to purchase an assault weapon versus purchase any weapon until the age of 21. We couldn't even pass that. There isn't an answer beyond that. It's it's a terrifying situation. And you were talking earlier about being desensitized. I had spoken on a panel the day of the Ivaldi shooting and I, walk, I walked out with other candidates and some of our candidates and I was feeling super positive and pumped up about what we were gonna do and what we were gonna change in this country. And I read the news and I was standing there with our communications manager who is 25 years old. And she started to cry and she said, my entire life, this is what I've lived with and it's not going to change and my children are going to live with this and this is just the reality. And I was standing there with another mom who was running for state senate and honestly we went and got ice cream because we could not process what had happened yet again. And we sat quietly and we ate ice cream and then an hour later we started to talk about it. It is so traumatizing and so many people are completely desensitized and they don't understand it. So I'm sorry but I do not have an answer. I wish I did. I don't know. Hopefully somebody else on this call does though. Well, this is it's going to take a collective obviously there's like there's this is deep and rooted and other countries have made bolder and swifter action but there's something unique about our culture and how long we've let this stand in many ways that I think we really have to understand and reckon with in many ways. And Pat, I see your hand up. If you want to put, um, and Linda, if you want to put um, comments or questions in the chat, that's how we've designed tonight's session so we can um, keep the space 
sort of moving along and we don't, but we definitely welcome that. So please use the chat function um, and you can um, add your comments there and I'll, I'll, I'll read them off um, or, if, and especially if there are questions, I'll fold them in. So Grace, I'll go to you next um, on just wondering more, more to say here. I mean, it, I, I didn't mean to design an impossible question, but like we have to get to some sort of series of answers or at least steps forward, even if we're starting in a small state like Vermont. So what do you think about how to create schools and public spaces, having more safety and having frankly a reckoning level conversation with what, what it's gonna take? Uh, frankly, I have a really interesting perspective on this because this was my reality my entire life starting from eighth grade after Sandy Hook happened and I became aware of gun violence in this country, I never stepped into a classroom again and felt safe. And following Sandy Hook, we were faced with bomb threats every single week, threats for people to come into our schools yet again, especially because uh, we were on national news, people knew about us, there was just an increase. And living with that fear every single day is traumatizing, like everyone else has said. And a lot of what my community has tried to figure out is like, yeah, how do we change this? And I mean, something that I think is very important is safe reporting systems. Sandy Hook Promise um, pushes out their safe reporting system, which a lot of schools across the country have adapted. And it is just as simple as like, see something, say something. I don't know if anyone has seen the PSA Sandy Hook Promise has released, but they're along the lines of a lot of times people show direct signs of these things. A lot of times people, specifically the Fairhaven, what happened that was saved because of safe reporting and someone reporting, even if, and something I think is really important to say is like, even if you have an inkling, it's okay to like, feel that and be scared. And I think like certain times, some people just know if someone has bad intentions. And, but the example that they use in P the PSA is that this kid is looking up guns online and posting things on the internet. And um, just in the Chicago shooting, the shooter was a rapper that posted on SoundCloud about gun violence and how he wanted to use a gun to harm people. And I just think like was, and I get rap as a culture, but to me that um, it was very violent as well. It screamed something is not right. And so he lacks empathy. And maybe somewhere along the line, if someone had reported that it could have changed the outcome of the event. So that's what I think would be the most important thing. Um, and I think what, Vermont lacks is the knowledge that Sandy Hook Newtown is very similar to every single town in Vermont. We were a small suburban community that everyone knew each other. You thought everyone knew each other. You thought everyone was safe. You thought no one could think like this, but living amongst you, and I don't want to participate in any kind of fear mongering, but I think what everyone across the country has kind of put into their brains. I mean, especially people in my generation is that if it can happen there, it can happen anywhere. And having that knowledge and wanting to pass legislation and wanting to create a safer community is I, all we really can do. Thanks, Grace. Can I? I see your hand, I see your hand. Is that a, is that yeah, a hand yeah. raise? <laughs> There was, there was a piece of legislation, and I can't remember what it was called a couple of weeks ago, that was basically like an Amber Alert system, that if there was an active shooter, you would get a text. You, people would be alerted. 168 Republicans voted against that. How are we supposed to, you cannot have a conversation with people if you vote against something that simple. What is the reason? If there's an active shooter, wouldn't you want to be alerted? Wouldn't you want to know? And they voted against that. Sorry, that is just that I came up. Nope. I'm not no to. apologies. It's the rule number one when I share space. No apologies. Speak, the, speak the truth. Yep. The number one thing we need to do is raise as much money as humanly possible for the candidates who are running against these people who are taking these votes. So the people who are owned by the NRA, we have to raise money for the people who are running against them. That is the number one thing we can do. 
And while this is not a campaign event, elections matter. So yes. just want to just put that out there. Elections matter. And, and frankly, just asking all the candidates, um, doesn't matter what political stripes people are, um, what, what people are doing to, to actually move, not just say, I, I will think about it, I'll get back to you, or I even support it, but what are you actively going to do in this, again, just looking here at the state of Vermont, to move this forward and to, and to make sure the governor at the same time has that level of conversation and accountability, most importantly, um, because we are so such a, 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 like a hair trigger away, no pun, no pun intended there for something happening here. And, and we had all this time to work towards preventing it and making a different reality here in Vermont and pushing our country in a different direction um, in our little state. I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna go to just, Al, if you wanna anything, add anything, and then I'm gonna go to the questions that are starting to appear in the chat before we um, round out with some just reminders of what your organizations are gonna be working on as the legislature. Um, picks back up in January here in Vermont. So Ali, first to you, and then I'm gonna go to, uh, into Kelly's question and then Melinda's comment. Great, yeah, I just, I wanna say, I really appreciate the fact that you use the word violent culture, because um, so often we hear that mental illness is the cause of some of these really um, horrific, um, you, know, think, you know, violent mass shootings, yet um, it's really a cultural issue that, you know, places the target on, um, you know, black, indigenous people and other people of color on, on queer and transgender folks and a culture that's kind of built on um, white supremacy and, um, and hatred. So, and I, I don't mean to say that everybody is like this, but we have so much of it ingrained in so many places in our culture. And if we don't tackle this sort of cultural shift, um, you know, we'll keep seeing these things kind of happen too. Thanks, Ali. And we're doing ourselves no favor. Again, I feel being so unresponsive, but I mentioned before about the multiple generations, that is compounding the violent culture, right? They have been raised in no other space other than knowing that school shootings can happen anytime, that um, that that the imagery that they're, you know, there's, we're swimming in all the time um, is somehow normal because they see it there. And, and I think it's just, it's, um, it, well, it's again, another moment of grappling around the next generation that we are raising and what we, and what, um, where are our standards? Where, where are our values? Like, what are we, where are we leading with here? And it's certainly not the right thing. Um, so you brought up a little bit about um, hate crimes and targeting and um, uh, folks with minoritized identities, uh, queer folks, LGBTQIA folks, um, folks of color, indigenous folks, black folks, um, et cetera. I think when we talk about school shootings, sometimes the other stuff can recede into the background, but there's, there's been a serious uptick tick of violence gun violence attacks, et cetera, on folks based on their racial identity and their sexual identity and their gender identity, um, especially trans folks in particular and um, folks of color, of course. So Kelly had put a question in there because again, really want to emphasize Vermont is not some bubble, despite what pop culture likes to say that Vermont's some sort of Shangri-La, like you're gonna retire there and everything's fine and dandy. We are so not fine and dandy. And so um, Kelly asked the question, there was an issue recently here with a man in Canaan, Vermont, which um, for those folks not familiar is way up in the, as far Northeast corner as you could possibly get before you hit Canada and New Hampshire. It's like where those, those borders meet in, in Vermont. It's a very small community, K through 12 school that's literally one building, just in terms of context of how small we're talking about this community is. Um, and they had a, um, a parent threaten to kill, literally kill people at the school. If anyone with LGBTQIA um, uh, identity interacted with them, they specifically called out drag queens as well, as I recall in the, in the news stories. And he told the police, his parent told the police that he was trying to obtain a gun and just felt like, um, and, and Kelly's saying, it just felt like he was, uh, sorry, it was just felt like it was not, a, there was not a lot to being done around the situation um, beyond charging him with making threats. Uh, and it was just sort of another one of those like piff and it was two days before the school year ended and what the response by a very overwhelmed school district um, was they just closed school for the final two days early and they and they have yet to really, at least what we've seen, um, you know, in other parts of the state in terms of media, there's been no response, no um, certainly state conversation spark. This is another tricky thing I just want to name it happens in so many states with part time legislatures, where these big things happen, and we're, we're not going to sidetrack into the world of the Supreme Court, but these big things happen outside of a part-time legislature's time in session. So the Vermont legislature ends usually around May. These big things happen. And yet we don't go back and start to really dig into this. We just simply wait, it feels like until January. And not to get on my soapbox, but I think there's a piece here too around naming the urgency of getting to the bottom of this and taking the time we need to really dive into good policy making. And this one is one, for example, that I think Vermont needs to grapple with more is around hate crimes and the intersection, again, 
of uh, gun policy, easy access, quick access um, to people who are, who are moving with intentions of hate and targeting um, vulnerable populations. So can anyone, I'll open this up to anyone, and you don't, don't all have to speak to it either, just to keep an eye on time. Can anyone speak to this either uh, specific situation in Canaan or um, the larger connection between gun violence and, and violence against queer folks in this, in this country and or I want to add and or folks of color or other mi minoritized identities. Does anyone want to speak to that one? Um, I would say, oh, sorry. Okay. Um, I would say there, I mean, there's a lot to this that could be done. I, I think accountability with the local police and, but as well as there's not really any laws in Vermont that say that they have to confiscate this and putting in stricter legislation will only help us. But I also find voting these people out and just talking about this and getting more people that believe this way. And I mean, I'm not sure of the political situation in Canaan, but if I know that corner, I'm sure it's on the more conservative side. Um, I would hope that a younger generation of people might be talking and spreading this viewpoint. And I would hope that just education on this would help, especially in a corner where this probably isn't talked about a lot and gun culture is so saturated and hunting culture as well. Um, and I think that would just, because a lot of people completely lack the empathy towards minorities and that's frightening. And it's a problem that is widespread across our country, but what Vermonters are, should continue to do is lessen those people in power and increase the empathetic ones. Um, I would say, I would use that word for that. Um, yeah. Thanks, Grace. Does anyone else want to comment on the on the the, the um on the the targeting the use of hate the guns and hate crimes um hate crimes in general of course but just how that all interfaces with the violent culture the pieces we're talking about here Luba? i don't know how you address it without talking about what the government is doing right now to lgbtqia children we have you know legislation basically we have political refugees who are, having, who are having to leave Arkansas and Arizona and Alabama and Texas to keep their trans children safe from the government because we have governors who are sending protection, children's protective services against parents who are supporting and loving their children and making sure that they get gender affirming life-saving health care. So if we're gonna have a conversation about violence against minorities and especially LGBTQIA children, we have an all out attack on trans kids in this country. There was a, a piece of legislation recently in Florida that would basically, there was one school district in particular that is having a fight about this, that if an LGBTQIA children uh, goes on a overnight trip, on a school trip, a letter has to go home to every parent. That's child abuse. And this is the legislation that we're talking about. So we need to address what the government, what Congress, what we're doing at the federal level to trans children in particular in this country, the don't say gay bill, Let's have a conversation about what both Republicans and Democrats are doing when it comes to this. You know, we had a Democrat running for governor who called the don't say in New York, who said, and he was a friend of mine until he said this, but he called the don't say gay bill reasonable. And we had to have an entire argument about it. And he had no clue what it actually did. And that's a problem. So we have to talk about the violence that our government right now is perpetrating on trans children, on LGBTQ children. And then we can have a conversation about easy access to guns and this violence that is now just absolutely part of our culture. Thank you for connecting that. Yet another example of the intersectionality of all this policy, right? So when, when that happens and there's this othering or dehumanizing or even, you know, um, well, I really want to emphasize othering of of someone who's not part of the dominant culture, white dominant culture, heteronormative uh, dominant culture, um, it makes it so easy to disassociate, right? To to not be empathetic, even if if a if a young person has those skills, to to and also to in, internalize, right? A lot of this oppressive um, oppressive policy that's coming out to internalize that something is wrong with me, and it it it, it creates all of the perfect. Um, uh, conditions for what we were talking about before of like really understanding how do we get to this place with this culture being so um, 
so dehumanizing, so um, desensitized, and so violent. Because um, these are vi these are acts of violence. These kind of legis um, uh, legislative and executive orders, these actions in these states, um, that that is truly a, another. Uh, I think you know form of violence and how um, our leaders are acting. Ali, do you want to add anything before we move on to um, Melinda's questions? Totally fine to pass too, because I want to make sure. But I want to make sure I give you airtime as well on this. Yeah, I just you know, I. I really appreciate what you said about this idea that, you know, Vermont is this progressive haven, which is what so many Vermonters think, that it's a welcoming place. But again, we're not one of the whitest states in the country by accident. Um, it's not an accident that we are this way. It is because of so many of the aggressions, so much of the hate that pushes people out of their towns, their communities. And it is a battle for a lot of them to stay. Um, and I think that um, one, you know, the people who are thinking that it's a welcoming state, how can we, how can we reshape this idea for them? And really, how can we just keep guns out of the hands of violent white supremacists? How, if we're not, um, if we're allowing easy access to guns, that inherently means we're allowing access to guns to um, white supremacists. And, and that's something that should be included in, when we're looking at background checks. Um, and because a lot of times it, it won't even, it won't even rise to the level of um, you know, um, crime or something like that. It'll just be threats, Confederate flags, um, you know, spray painting, Aryan Brotherhood symbols. Um, you know, it's just the threats and intimidation and the aggressions. Um, and then when you think that the people that they have to call to help them in these situations is law enforcement, when we see so much disproportionate impact of policing in our state, um, it's just a real problem. So how are we gonna kind of, again, transform this, this culture in Vermont that says that these kinds of things are okay, because they're not. Thanks, Ali. And thanks for bringing that, those pieces in because militias and armed folks, I mean, they exist all throughout, you know, especially in Northern New England, it's not, again, like we're immune to this and these very armed January 6th, right, 2021. If there's anything that just put how, how um, unfettered some of these actions are and how armed and violent and aggressive, even against, you know, what we thought would be these um, most protected and sacred spaces. It's, it's a real, uh, it's a real thing. And we're going to move into um, what comes next in just a moment, but I wanted to just give a little moment to Melinda's comment here, where she said, I'm thinking of the women in, in Chile who wore a colored headscarf to protest their disappeared relatives. So during um, a lot of the uh, people know the political history there around people who were disappeared, so murdered, kidnapped um, for being a political dissident, dissidents or disagreeing with the government or their identities. There's a whole slew of pieces about the history there. A visible sign of, she asked, is there a visible sign of protest we can do? Um, are we numerous enough for those of us who I assume agree on these issues? And um, would this help the conversation? So as an organizer, uh, as a labor organizer for most of my professional career, I think it's so important for organizing um, to really think about like what are uh, what our tactics, activities, things we can collectively do. Um, so it's, we don't just wait for our legislators to be our saviors in this. Like how do we collectively organize and, and bring people together? So, so thoughts on either Melinda's ideas or just what can collectively we do um, to, to elevate this conversation and um, fully more than just legislators engage anyone on this one. Um, Gun Sense is proposing a bill this upcoming session that gives more uh, freedom to local mun municipalities. Sorry, that word is hard tonight. Um, uh, Burlington a couple of years ago tried to pass some kind of firearm um, act as a city and they were not allowed to do so. So I think that this could really help our towns, especially a place like Burlington, which we may require stricter gun laws because we're a bigger city, more populated, um, not, and we're also politic, different politically than some of the other cities in the state. So why kind of should we sit under the state level while we could be doing something on a local level? And I also wanted to say like the wear orange um, movement that every town produces like a couple days a year, I and it's really sad, but after a lot of mass tragedies, uh, they do tell everyone to wear orange um, in 
solace with gun violence and just in support. So I think that would, that's kind of a cool way to protest. Thanks, Grace. And for folks who are, who are watching, um, Burlington, I think it's at least five plus years ago, I'm trying to remember the year, passed a charter change, which would have allowed the city, this is a part of our, our structure here in Vermont, towns can create um, further local laws, but need to get approval by the voters first, well, the local town select board or city council first, and then by voters, and then it goes to the legislature to ultimately approve it or not. And where that gun, that piece of gun policy um, control to create ordinances to further further do gun control here in Burlington, where it, where it tripped up was when it went to the state house. The state house refused to pass that, that uh, the legislature, the house and Senate refused to move that forward. So it just shows you that even when there's local efforts, there's these, system, these systems, it matters the interchange between local and state government um, and who we elect to these, these positions. And I think it's even more timely given the increase of of gun violence in Ver Burlington, Vermont. Um, and I always say Burlington is not is not detached from the rest of the state. What's going on here in terms of the um, local leaders' response and the police department's response, and the very dangerous narratives um, that are going on right now with our acting chief of police, who's racializing it um, in a really problematic way, and, and dog whistles are being used in how he's um, talking about it. It is it is about time that we start to think about this as a city again and try either go back to that charter change or have or really start to move this um, in in a um, way forward. So Luba or Ali, any any comments on that piece around organizing and collect in the in the collective action we can might might be able to take? There's so much organizing and collective action that we need to take around gun violence, around row, around so many things. Honestly, I would love to see us shut everything down, and it's not realistic, and that's the reality. I'd love to have not. You know, we have the walkouts with one day and everybody walks out of school, but I'd love to see a complete walkout of everybody and teachers and students for a serious period of time until we can pass an assault weapons ban. The reality is people can't afford to do that. The unions aren't going to support it. Teachers need to get paid. I would love to see that happen. I don't know that it's possible. Um, you know, in Iceland, when they, when they tried to repeal abortion, women just took to the streets and stopped functioning completely and shut the country down and got it fixed. We can't really do that. We have such a large country and so many people don't have the financial ability to do that that unfortunately I don't see I don't see it being feasible as much as I would like to say yes, that's what we need to do. I don't know the logistics behind it. Um, but actually I'm curious, Ali, is that like have you know has mom's demand thought about doing something like that? Have they thought about having longer walkouts? Is there any sort of feasible way that you could realistically do that? Yeah, our students demand action um, networks across the country have done um, a great job of, you know, kind of leading this effort around walkouts and things like that. Um, you know, we've some of my favorite images are seeing the sea of red shirts in Washington, D.C. or other big rallies that happen. Um, or even showing up in mass to a meeting where they're talking about um, gun violence, showing up in mass to school board meetings, um, all wearing the red shirt. So I think um, that has been very powerful to see. Um, and we're still a relatively new chapter, but you know, we we're always welcome. You know, I'll wait till the next question to get into how you can get involved with us. Great. Thanks, Ali. And I'm just gonna share that, you know, the um uh, just again, to illustrate why it's so important to reach out to your legislators and your city councilors and your school board members, um, about a, a month or two ago, uh, or I forget when Uvalde actually happened, it, see, it just, it goes, and then we all go back into our normal lives, which I'm air quoting, because we're tr try I am at least personally trying to commit to not revert back to that desensitized trauma response just protect myself and my family. Uh, some families from the child care center that my youngest goes to reached out and said, hey, as a fellow parent who happens to be a state legislator, because that's how we roll here in Vermont, we're very accessible. We are parents doing drop off at child care and school just like everybody else. They reached out and asked like, what, what's going on with gun policy um, in the state? And as we were sitting there talking it through, they weren't all from Burlington, some were from Colchester, I, one was from Hinesburg. And they, were try, and they were asking me a bit about, because we talked a little bit about school safety and the lockdown drills and these policies. And I was, as we were talking it through, um, it, it occurred to me how important it is to even interrupt those conversations where the autopilot response is just, you know, have these, 
um, these lockdown drills and don't ask the questions about are we are further traumatizing our students, right? Like have parents actually and families talk to school board members. Why is that the policy? Why is that the response versus thinking largely, more largely and broadly around the social emotional well being of our students, as well as connecting school board members to the gun policy instead of just, you know, um, for their control, trying to control an in, impossible thing to control, right? So it, it, I raise that just because it's it, it's interesting to think about um, all the different forms of action, not just storming the state capitol, but thinking about the power and decision making that school board members have, the power and decision making that folks have around um, just organizing. And, and again, I was a labor organizer for a long time for the teachers union, but there's plenty of states where teachers have walked out Right, they didn't seek permission from unions or school districts. They walked out, and and that collective action is actually possible. It, it was happening around 2018, 2019, around you know issues around um, uh, just the functionality of, of public schools in certain states and the lack thereof. But this this one, it seems like a, a spark again, even if it starts on a local or state level, is necessary to just you know rattle rattle some um, some urgency. And I and I hope that the Vermont advocates here can can see the way for. Um, how Vermont can like lead that way. I want to I want to add one more comment before we wrap up with our final question to our panelists and, and we wrap up our time tonight, uh, which came in from Pat, um, who's been uh, messaging with one of our co-hosts. Uh, and Pat, who I don't know your pronouns, I'm just going to say Pat. Pat offered. We are also advocating for the use of. Um, we should be advocating for the use of federal money to train local law enforcement on the Vermont ERPA or ERPO laws. These acronyms always trip me up, as, as there's so many in, in the world of, of lawmaking. But the ER, ERPO, which is the emergency protection piece that we were talking about before, right, Ali? That's what. ERPO roughly stands for. And it is, uh, and Pat goes on to say, it is seldom used that ERPO law in Vermont and even law enforcement and judges um, seldom use it. So we need to advocate uh, with Vermont government to get also a secure storage bill um, to take place here in Vermont. And that gets a little bit also into um, just easy access as we were talking about before. So Pat, thanks for putting that, that comment forward. All right, panelists. So I'm hoping we can like maybe break the, the gloomy clouds a little bit. It has been stormy here in the state of Vermont today. So how can we just break in a little bit of sunlight into what, what are you all pushing forward in this moment and, and um, trying to encourage us as the state legislators and the governor, I want to keep adding, he is a player here to consider as we go get ready for January, which is not that far away, but as bill drafting um, starts in the fall, what are, what are you hoping to see from maybe like the top two things your organizations are trying to advance here? Ali, do you wanna go first? And then we'll go to Grace and then we'll go to the federal just for the wrap it up too. Okay, Uba. okay, Ali? Yeah, I just wanna end with, you know, how you can get involved with Moss Man. So we are a relatively new chapter. Um, there's chapters across the United States. Um, but we are entirely grassroots powered. Um, yes, we do a lot of advocacy, um, but we also um, have been working on, a, on our gun sense candidates program. So getting people who are um, gun sense certified into office and supporting them. Um, that way they fill out a, um, one of our questionnaires basically, and then we kind of support them. Um, and it lets everybody know that they are a gun sense candidate. Um, we also, Pat is on the call and is a mom's demand action volunteer as well, and does a lot of our um, Be Smart Secure Storage education. So um, helping um, parents and caregivers know how to, and people with guns, um, know how to store their guns uh, properly and how to have these conversations. If you are a parent or caregiver with another person, if your kid is going to their house, how do you talk about if their house is safe? Um, and so we've been working um, on that and we do a lot of partnership and coalition building. Um, and um, there's one more thing. Oh, and it's just having conversations. This is like a huge thing you can do just on your own, talking to your friends and family, dispelling some of these myths that you're hearing, um, you know, advocating for um, your legislators, our state is so small, it's so easy to get in touch with your legislators and. Um, and talk about the things that you want to see um, in gun violence prevention in our state. Um, if you text JOIN to 64433, I'll put it in the chat, um, you um, will get a little questionnaire and we'll you'll be on our list. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Allie. Grace, what more can people be doing? What are you all thinking about um, pushing Vermont towards in the next six months? Yeah, well, talking about gun senses, legislation that we're writing up right now. We have a list of things, but I think personally my two 
that I am focused on is a semi-automatic rifle ban. I do not think that should be in the hands of average citizens and it cannot be used for hunting. It is only meant to kill its host, which is a human. Um, and I think that I would love to see that on the federal level too. And I think we have a better chance of doing it in Vermont because it is just common sense, frankly, but also safe storage is definitely up there. I think that when we're looking at suicide, safe storage will do a lot for that. And it is just, yeah, intersection, intersectionally included with all of the other things as well. Um, so where we also are hoping to work with a lot of gun sense candidates, we're kind of narrowing down who we really know that is on our side right now. Um, so yeah, like Ali said, it's just important to support people and know if they're a gun sense candidate or not. And I know that every town has that resource right on their website as well. Um, and then if anyone wanted to get involved with gun sense, we have a membership link on our website and we're always looking for volunteers and resources and contacts and yeah. Thanks, Grace. And if you want to put Gun Sense Vermont's uh, uh, website in the, into the chat, that would be great. Um, yeah. As we, uh, I'm going to give you the floor, Luba, in just a second. Same thing to Moms Demand Action, the Vermont chapter. If there's a particular page, Ali, you want to put in there. And when, when we send out the recording, we'll make sure the public access also has that text in case there's a space to put that caption info in. So Luba, um, again, no magic ball on the federal level, but is there anything that you wanted to offer people up about if there's on a federal level that you know of that people can get involved in um, to really just... Uh, try to make some change and and not stay in this in the in the whatever in action uh, place yeah as much as this is not a campaign event i'm going to agree with both of you support the candidates who are going to actually vote the right way on these issues figure out figure out who is running in your district figure out who you can get behind figure out who you can help get elected um all of our vote mama candidates our gun sense candidates look at everybody that that mom's demand is supporting those are the people that you should support and volunteer if you're interested in getting involved in Vote Mama, our website is votemama.org and votemamafoundation.org. We are about to launch um, our C4 organizing arm as well, which is Vote Mama Lobby. So we are launching that in September and that is our advocacy and grassroots organizing arm. So please sign up for both of our mailing lists and you'll get all of the information when we launch that. Get involved. That's the only thing that you can do is get involved, sign up, volunteer, help these candidates, pay attention, call your legislators if they're voting the wrong way on these bills, call them, call them every single day because they're hearing from the NRA. They hear from the NRA, they get their money. You need to be making sure that they hear your voice and you need to be making sure that you're supporting their opponents. Thanks, Luba. And I'll just wrap it up by saying thank you all so, so much. And those who will view this later, um, thanks for taking the time to watch this through and to really think seriously about what we need to be doing at this time. Um, uh, we, we need to be taking action and we need to be holding um, local at state level here in Vermont and federally our electeds accountable. We all have a role in this as we talk about culture and the intersectionality of, of how this all shows up. Um, again, I'm State Representative Emma mulaney Sanic. I'm gonna put my contact information in the chat for those who are here in the room, but you can find my information on the legislative website for the Vermont legislature. I'm happy to have one-on-one -on -one conversations, especially for folks in my district about this. Um, and I'll be looking, I'm sure I'll be partnering with uh, Tanya she's also reelected um, this time to the Senate um, to really try to put some bold legislation forward because we bold legislation expands the uh, possibility and conversation. If we, if we continue to do incremental changes, we'll never get anywhere. So I'm here for that. That's why I run for office and why I serve. And I hope um, you all stay engaged in this conversation. So thanks so much for being here.